Okay. Yeah, very sorry for this. <laughs> Something like this has actually never happened to me, but yeah, it always happens at least once, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, Julian, again, thanks for, for the very nice introduction. And I'm actually super, I feel super honored to speak after Oli and to also like be invited to this uh, webinar today. And uh, you actually asked me to present something chemical. So I'm going to present uh, some concepts on the asymmetric modification of cellulose nanocrystals and actually the challenges behind. And there were lots of different collaborators involved into this topic, and they're not even all listed here. So, uh, but uh, there's one person that I definitely want to emphasize here. It's uh, Gwendolyn uh, Delpierre from Fribourg. And because at least the first part of this presentation is uh, a very big part of her PhD thesis and yeah, very nice work actually what she did. So um, yeah, if you think about cellulose nanocrystals, we have a multifunctional template and there are of course natural functionalities like the surface OH groups uh, reducing end group aldehydes that result from the cellulose backbone. But in principle, as a consequence of the top-down isolation, we're mostly speaking about uh, at least surface derivatization. So for example, um, when we isolate cellulose nanocrystals by sulfuric acid hydrolysis, we introduce sulfate half esters to uh, the surface, which are responsible for the colloidal properties of cellulose nanocrystals. If we go a different pathway, uh, like, for example, the uh, isolation method that we use in the Avocontoris group, we use uh, HCl gas electrolysis that, in principle, doesn't introduce surface charges, but also these nanocrystals are not really dispersible. So, we um, add a second step it's a uh, surface tempo oxidation. And by that, we uh, introduce C6 carboxylates. And these are also like um, uh, provide good colloidal properties, so stability in dispersion but also um, they can be used as a reaction template for chemical modification. But today um, it's about asymmetric uh, modification and yeah, how can we actually do this? So there's one very obvious way, um, especially when we talk about cellulose one nanocrystals, so we can exploit the inherent uh, directionality and modify them on the reducing end side um, by endwise modification. And this is a topic that has like gained lots of uh, attention throughout the last years and uh, lots of people who actually work on this. And uh, there's maybe also another way to introduce asymmetric functionalities or asymmetrically introduce functionalities from the surface. And I want to show you one idea how we could maybe also achieve this. But why do we actually do this? So why are we interested in these Janus type uh, particles that we would obtain? First of all, and that's something that has been also shown by uh, Bruno Jean um, in Nantes, so a couple of weeks ago, is that we can tailor our self-assembly. Uh, we can do this on surfaces, we can do this in dispersion. And he showed a very nice, um, like these very nice star-shaped assemblies by crafting uh, jeffamine to the reducing end groups of cellulose nanocrystals. And one other idea behind this asymmetric modification is also to use these uh, N-isotropic properties in a nanoscale and to design materials. And this is the second example here. It's by my uh, colleague Han. He's now a PhD student in Evo Contoris group. And a special thing is also that, I mean, he has published, I think, two or three articles during his master's, so really impressive. And one um, contribution was, for example, to use these endwise modified cellulose nanocrystals in nanocomposites. And they um, had a reactive group at the reducing end and clicked them into a double network to reinforce a double network and yeah, to fabricate this nanocomposite. And all these like um, asymmetric modifications are based on, yeah, on our end group aldehyde and uh, the chemical uh, freedom that actually this aldehyde group provides. So one very common reaction is a uh, ligation where we use either oxymes or hydrazine derivatives. Another one pot reaction, it's actually two step, but one pot reaction is reductive amination, where we attach uh, amino functionalities to the reducing end. Then one other way is a two step pathway where we first oxidize the reducing end to a carboxylate and then use amide coupling reactions. And a fourth pathway, that's something that we published uh, in 2019, is a selective condensation by the so called Nuvenar condensation on the reducing end groups. 
And this sounds really easy, but uh, we shouldn't forget that this reducing end aldehyde is actually in a, a tautomerism or in an equilibrium with a close hemiacetone. And the equilibrium is heavily on the side of the hemiacetone. So we have to find chemistry that actually activates this reducing end group. And it's an acid-base catalyzed reaction, which can be also uh, catalyzed by water, as it is shown in, in this example here. So we just need one water, mo uh, water molecule to open the uh, ring. And uh, yeah, by this can catalyze actually, or can shift the equilibrium, equilibrium towards the open chain aldehyde. And one other challenge behind this um, is the analytical confirmation, because the amount of newly introduced uh, functionalities at the reducing end is very low. And uh, it's actually very challenging to really show that we have a chemo-selective and site-selective modification. And all like, for example, common methods like uh, IR spectroscopy and solid state NMR, which are very often used for cellulose nanocrystals, are not really um, efficient or sufficient to actually show the site-specific modification. Yeah, our recent work, and as I mentioned, this is like uh, Gwendolyn's work mainly, was on polymer crafting by atom transfer radical polymerization, so a controlled uh, polymerization approach selectively from the reducing end groups of cellulose nanocrystals. And the key step here is actually to first of all immobilize uh, covalently the ATRP initiator at the reducing end. And for this, we mainly used uh, two different pathways, and we modified cellulose nanocrystals and as a model compound, also cellobios. And uh, we did this by two different routes. The first one was a direct reductive amination, so uh, the uh, eme information and the reduction in one step. Um, we used for this one an amino functionalized initiator that was also synthesized in our labs. Um, it's a water-based reaction, acid catalyzed. Um, we use picolinoborane as reducing agent because it's very selective for the imine reduction. And the second pathway was, first of all, also like a reductive amination because it's a very efficient reaction for reducing end groups and very selective. And with this first step, we attached a DMN, and this was followed by attaching an NHS activated initiator. However, this um, two-step pathway, even though it's also published, but uh, it turned out to be a bit more problematic because we were not 100% sure also about the selectivity of this NHS activated initiator towards only the new, newly introduced amino group. And as I mentioned also, the uh, um, analytical confirmation is something that is very challenging for endwise modification. And in our case, we used a combined setup. So an indirect approach that is based on, deriv uh, on the derivatization of the reducing end group and its quantification, it's this BCA assay. And this is just um, that the reducing end group is used to reduce kappa two to kappa one, which is then detected uh, spectrophotometrically as this kappa one complex that is shown here. And this indirect approach, uh, which also uh, gives some quantitative values is combined with a direct approach. And for this one, we use solution state NMR analysis in ionic liquids. And this is done at University of Helsinki and the expert, experts are uh, Alistair King and Tatiana. So they do all these nice measurements. And we have different 1D and 2D NMR techniques. And as I mentioned before, a key is also to use cello bios models to uh, replicate the reactions on CNCs and use the cello bios as a low molecular weight model compound uh, to simplify the signal assignment. And just as one example here, um, even for the ones who are not totally familiar with NMRs, so this is a 2D NMR spectrum, it's an HMBC. So what we see in this one is like a multiple bond correlation from the proton to the carbon. And this is a very important technique to also uh, assign uh, the signals. And one key technique is also diffusion editing. So we use diffusion ordered spectroscopy, which enables that um, we edit out everything which is only adsorbed to the CNC surface. So what we in the end see are only uh, signals which are covalently attached or from covalently attached functionalities. And by this, we could actually confirm that we modified our reducing end groups. And we also um, see the correlation 
uh, between the different units to, to the end group of the initiator. And uh, in parallel, we also did the BCA assay and observed that the reduction of the reducing end groups from 16 to 7 micromole per gram, which means that we had a conversion of at least 50%. However, the chemical shift of the group that we observed was actually quite a surprise because it's not in the position where we expected it to be from the NMR spectrum of our uh, initiator itself. And this actually uh, suggested that we might have either in the ionic liquid or already during the reductive amination site reactions. And this is something when I come again to the challenges of end price modification, because we also really need to understand the chemistry that we are carrying out. So it's, yeah, this is a key <laughs> to all these Janus type materials. So uh, yeah, the site reactions of the ATFP initiator to understand this more, we uh, used our ATFP initiator, this amino functionalized ATFP initiator, and exposed it to different conditions. So we dissolved it in DMSO and we observed exactly the signals that we expect. Uh, we heat it in DMSO and then we already see a conversion. So substitution of our bromine, which is the active group during ATFP, to a hydroxy group. And then we also um, dissolved it in the ionic liquid and we have a, rep a rapid decomposition or a rapid elimination reaction actually to an acrylate. And the same happened, even though it's not shown here, but it's described in very much detail in the paper. We also observe, observe the same if we expose the HRP initiator uh, to the reductive elimination conditions. And um, the polymerization was still carried out and we still were able to craft polymer on the reducing end groups. Um, but we really have to keep in mind that the reaction conditions used to immobilize the HRP initiator deactivated at least part of the initiator and so like um, passivated the CNCs for the later polymerization reaction. But if you're interested in more details, I really recommend you to read the article. <laughs> okay, so this was to the end phase modification. Now it's the question like, can we also do an asymmetric third phase modification? And this is more challenging because over the third phase, we have a uniform decoration with OH groups and maybe so uh, so, uh, sulfate half ester groups or carboxylate groups, depending on the CNC set we have. But maybe there's still a way to do this. And this is something uh, that has been done on silicon nanoparticles, on polymer microgels, on uh, gold nanoparticles, but somehow not yet on cellulose nanocrystals. Um, so the system that we use for this are pickering emulsions. So we have a biphasic system. What we see here is an oil and water emulsion. So we have in the droplet core, we have an organic phase, we have a bulk water phase, and we have particles stabilizing the interface. And this particle absorption to the interface is simply based on the minimization of the interfacial energy. And we were now interested in like, can we actually use this uh, assembly of cellulose nanocrystals to the interface for the chemical modification? And can we even modify them from both sides, so from the water side and also from the oil side? And for this one thing that is very important is um, their immersion in both phases. So are they more exposed to the water phase? Are they uh, more immersed in the oil phase? And this is something that is guided or uh, determined by the surface chemistry. And also what is interesting here, can we play maybe with the distance between the crystals? So for example, if we modify them from the water side uh, and we have a very dense layer of nanocrystals at the interface, can we shield some parts of the crystal from uh, the modification? So to have like some hysteric hindrance. And one thing that is also maybe interesting here is uh, do we actually maybe have dynamic properties? So are the crystals uh, very, really irreversibly adsorbed to the interface or do they maybe turn? And the current proposition um, of this interface assembly is by Isabel Capon's group. So they are really the pioneers um, and very experienced in these pickering emulsion systems with cellulose nanocrystals. And their suggestion is based on uh, molecular dynamic simulations is that um, cellulose nanocrystals in their pristine form, so unmodified, uh, they are, of course, hydrophilic or also amphiphilic, actually. And what they found is that um, all the OH groups are actually immersed in the water phase and the cellulose nanocrystals adsorb to the interface um, only by their CH plane, so this uh, 200 plane. So this is the theory behind this. However, 
uh, we were still interested, can we still modify um, the cellulose nanocrystals at the interface uh, from the oil side? So, and the first reaction, so kind of a model here or proof of concept reaction was to use a pressure acidification for the reason also it's a water sensitive reaction. So it should happen exclusively from the oil side. And uh, yeah, and this was carried out in a very simple setup. So um, we prepared an oil and water emulsion. Uh, Dodekin was used as oil phase. Uh, we used um, a long chain fatty acid that was dissolved in Dodekin as our like, function group that we want to attach to the cellulose surface. Um, it was important here that this fatty acid is only soluble in the oil phase because if it's like a short chain fatty acid soluble in both phases, it destabilizes the emulsion. Then uh, we basically add an acid catalyst, which was in this case for this first trial, tree fluorescent acid, because it's efficient in catalyzing fishery esterifications. And as soon as there is another um, carboxylic acid present, it's not favored in the esterification reaction. That's at least the theory. And then we carried out our esterification reaction, which is also like a um, um, special thing here uh, at room temperature and only overnight. And the nice thing also with pickering emulsions is that you can easily uh, isolate the system. Um, so the emulsion droplets by centrifugation, then it can use acetone washing to destroy the uh, emulsion and isolate the single crystals. And then we just freeze dried. And then to get a first impression of what has happened, we did IR spectroscopy. I really like have to emphasize it's only the first impression because IR is very often used as like a single uh, characterization method. But of course, if we cannot distinguish here like things that happen through surface adsorption, so we don't have really confirmation for covalent modification, but it gives a first idea of that what has actually happened in the system. Um, the CNCs that we were working with were wood based. So, what we observe also in these uh, cellulose nanocrystals in the uh, fingerprint region are carboxylate stretching vibrations, which result from residual hemicellulose and also ethers uh, on the surface of the CNCs. And what we then observe when we introduce our fatty acid is a uh, new or enhanced signal, uh, which corresponds to ethers or even uh, also like residual free acid that might be adsorbed to the cell surface. So to gain more information, we then also did solid, uh, solution state NMR again in ion liquids. Um, that's what Alistair and Tanya again did. Um, you see here um, HSQC, so the direct correlation between proton and carbon. In the F2 direction, you see, or F2 dimension, you see the uh, diffusion additive proton spectrum again. And from this diffusion editing, as I mentioned before, we edit out everything that is adsorbed to the surface. We see our covalent modification. And we see that at least to a very low extent and likely to the C6 uh, groups, we introduce oleic chains. And, uh, but we also observed that we had a high amount of adsorbed acid to the surface. So this is interesting and this is very promising, but how is this actually possible? Because if we say that we have all OH groups immersed in the water phase, we shouldn't have reactivity of the OH groups from the oil sites. So that's at least what the theory said. And the system is even more, at least to me, maybe you have other ideas, but to me it's even more complex than endwise modification. Because also with this e serification reaction, we first of all have to understand the behavior of the single compounds. So what does our fatty acid do at different pH values? So it's said that it forms bilayers in acidic pH and micelles in basic pH, but this is only when we have a single fatty acid in water. We now have a dissolved fatty acid in dodecane. And does this fatty acid maybe together with the CNCs adsorb to the interface? And exactly like this adsorption to the interface together with the CNCs might create actually a reaction environment. Then we also need to understand when does this reaction actually happen? Is it really in the emulsion? Is it during the emulsification because we emulsify with ultrasound at very high local temperatures? Uh, or is it maybe during the drying? Maybe someone has a suggestion uh, for this um, because during the drying also we remove the water and if we had absorbed acid on the CNC surface, maybe we have a reaction that happens then. 
And how can we actually confirm this azometric modification? Chris, I mean, I was selling you NMR now as the method to understand azometric modification, but actually when we modify the furphrase, we cannot uh, solely use NMR because of course it uh, only shows the presence of the groups. And then we also yeah, need to understand the properties of these um, asymmetrically modified CNCs. And if we can maybe translate this reaction to other functional groups, or if we can maybe use the standard type particles in uh, new materials. And with that, I actually want to summarize uh, this talk. So yes, we can use endwise modification for uh, synthesizing or for fabricating these standard type uh, CNCs. I also think that Pickering emulsions are very uh, um, promising system for asymmetric surface modification, but that's something what we still have to confirm. And as you maybe saw in this talk is that the analysis, analysis of these systems is the major challenge actually here. And with this, I um, want to thank all different collaborators from different European and also like actually uh, worldwide institutions that were involved in these works. and. Um, I want to thank the organizers of this webinar that they invited me and Academy of Finland for the funding. And as Julia mentioned, um, at the moment, I'm at the Elect uh, Institute of Electronic and Sensor Materials in Germany as a guest scientist. And yeah, I also want to thank this hosting institution. And yeah, I want to thank you for your attention and yeah, I'm happy to discuss this with you. Thank you very much, Katja, for your great presentation. You, you opened up a new world, at least, at least for me. <laughs> Is there uh, questions from the audience? Um, I might have another question. Please, please, go ahead. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Hello, Katja. Um, so, Maybe I don't have really a solution to your problem regarding the ATLP initiator and, and the transformation of the end group, but maybe maybe at least a partial remedy. Um, so you said that the bromine is altered to something else. Uh, could you maybe use a chlorine, uh, chlorine initiator instead? I mean, it will cause maybe some other problems in, in the distribution of your polymers, but at least the initiator stays intact or more intact during your modification. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the bromine is known to be a very good leading group. And uh, definitely this could be something that we could still like explore is like, what is the impact of the initiator? And yeah, we were actually quite surprised to see this. And we also mm -hmm. didn't find anything that someone has described like this instability issues. So um, yeah, but definitely uh, changing the initiator would be the obvious way to do still explore. Thank you. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other questions? If, if not, then may, maybe I, I would like to ask, I mean, you, you mentioned that for the, or Chun-Lin, do you have a question? No, oh, uh, just to open my camera. Yeah, Hi. thanks. Uh, because you, you, you mentioned for, for the Pickering emulsions, CNC, you, you mentioned that, okay, the, the field of applications is still a bit unclear, but do, do you know where in about they could go? So you mean these Janus particles from Pickering emulsions? Yes. For example, um, I mean, it might be interesting for uh, polymer composites as well. It might be interesting way to decorate fur faces with this asymmetric, um, um, asymmetrically modified um, cellulose nanocrystals. It might be interesting in terms of stimuli responsive materials uh, that are like, dependent on this nanoscale and isotropy. Yeah, so there are several things that we are uh, thinking of, but I have to honestly say it, I'm very much interested in everything that happens at the interface and I'm sometimes uh, not so much yet in the materials uh, path, but um, yeah. Thank you very much. Do we have questions left? Any in the chat is nothing, I think. Good. I guess. Then it was a clear talk. <laughs> oh, so, um, 
we have one more question from Tina. She writes, thanks, Katya. May, maybe I did not catch this completely, but how do you deal with the twist of the CNC in the modification at the oil water interface, or is it not a problem? That's, that's exactly, that's a, that's a very good point. And I mean, um, there's articles that describe that of course the plurality of the, so the twist of the CNCs depends on the aspect ratio. So we need a certain aspect ratio or a certain length of the crystal to actually have this twist. And then there was um, an article by, what is it? I think it was also in Grenoble or something. I'm, I'm not totally sure. Uh, and he basically showed that also when uh, cellulose nanocrystals absorb to surfaces that they can lose their twist. So I don't know. I mean, uh, this, is, this is exactly the point and exactly the thing that is not considered in these models when they show that uh, with which side the CNC is assembled to the interface, they don't consider that there might be the chiral twist and that this might change this whole system. Yeah, thanks, Tina. <laughs> it's interesting. Thanks, Tina writes. In case I, I don't see any hands nor uh, questions in the chat, so I would like then to say thank you very much, Fatia, for this great presentation, and would give the word to Shunlin again.